Sadly, with being a young male metalhead, there does come a lot of incel culture that overlaps. And this isn't a particularly new thing, this has been happening for a very long time. And it's also sad to see that it kind of hits every age group of men, not just like a particular one. There's the classic invalidating a band because they're a quote unquote chick band. Which is really gross to invalidate not only a band, but a group of people for happening to like a sound of a band. Even the really cringy examples like seeing a woman in a metal shirt and like immediately assuming that it's probably her boyfriend's or she doesn't actually know who's on the shirt. And that's where these metalhead incels constantly fumble the fucking bag. Like a woman tells you her favorite metal band is motionless and white and all you can think about is how you don't think it's metal or it doesn't show up on metal archives. Stop being weird. Metal is not that serious. Learn to pick up on some social cues and, uh, you know, stop being an incel. Um, yeah, you think I give a shit about the strike going on? I'm not part of a union, fuck them. You guys don't even know me. I like small indie films, like Avengers and Frozen 2. Fuck those guys, I'm about to get paid. I'm gonna have my own show, I'm gonna be on red carpets. Look, my manager's already calling. Hello? I stand in solidarity with the union striking. I don't know about you guys, but I've always stood up for the little guy. I want to use my platform to uplift and highlight small independent creators. And to prove that, here's a picture of me hanging out with Tom Cruise. It's always, don't call me sis, that's offensive to me, that's a slur. Well bitch, what if I called myself sis? No, oh, no, it's quiet, how you feel about that? A trans girl being sis? <laughs> Oh, now you resonate with the term. Right. Misogyny. Transphobia. And turfism. Clock to tea. Do you mean the autistic ones? Like, just say it. Just say you don't like the autistic gays. That's what you mean by those gays, right? The autistic ones? And I mean, those gays are usually neurodivergent, not always autistic, but I'm emphasizing the autism for you to understand how awful your message is. And no hate to this creator, I don't know anything about you, please don't send hate or whatever, but like, let's be real, you are talking about the autistic ones. Just literally say which types of those gay people you mean. When you grew up, did you feel like an alien too? Spending your time with your head on the moon Spinning around in the big living room On your 36th month, did you shake your fist up at God? There's something I'm missing, I think he forgot And now I spend almost all my time distraught about things that don't matter to anyone I can feel everything everywhere all at once life of the party but i don't have any fun one single thread has to pull and i come undone the only people who understand do not exist i don't remember signing up for this stuck in my apartment while my friends have kids and what adult can see what is wrong and not fix it I'm trapped in myself, each big feeling eclipses the other And now I can't face my own dishes And I am too tired for anything I am afraid there are no other parts of me I've been unraveled and now I can hardly breathe Is this what they meant when they said disability? Oh my god, that is so funny, TikTok user S Middleton03. In case you missed that here, I'll type it, S Middleton03. What's even funnier about that is that if we did that, we'd have no border control. 
all your white moms and dads that work for ICE and the Border Patrol would be the ones getting hunted down. Did you know that from 2014 to 2019, the federal government received more than 4,500 complaints about the sexual abuse of immigrant children by ICE agents and the Border Patrol? Not to mention the doctors working for these people castrate them or make them infertile. Like, this might be some sick, funny joke to you, but it's not for us. It's not for the people with family members that have to jump through so many loopholes to have the same rights, basic rights, as you. Don't even get me started on white pastors and priests because we'd have a whole field day. Why is it that when someone is unfuckable to us that we don't see them as a human being? This can extend to trans people, people of color, disabled people. But just in general, I've noticed that when someone on TikTok has like a weird vibe, like you can tell they're made fun of in high school, they don't have great social skills, maybe they don't know how to do their makeup well, their clothes aren't expensive or good looking or well fitting. People in the comments will go in because of things that this person cannot change, bullying them for no reason. I see the same thing on Twitter and other social platforms where the second that someone says something stupid, we attack their looks. I'm a fat trans person and I have been on the receiving end of that. When my shit gets into the wrong hands, I get vile, vile hate comments. Videos of mine talking about my art about fat and trans people ended up on eating disorder Twitter a few months ago. And it really, really hurts to have people make fun of your appearance. And I don't think that it's justified. And I think you can make a lot stronger argument attacking people for their thoughts or beliefs than you can for being like, wow, you're not fuckable, so your opinion's invalid. You shouldn't have to be fuckable to be talked to like a person and not hated. Uh, 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 uh. Put that down. Yeah, this, oh, um, this creator, she's really cool. She makes a lot of like informational videos, but she calls out a lot of people that, you know, like non-indigenous people that get traditional markings. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I posted this one girl, um, she had my exact facial markings. Really? My exact facial markings. And then um, you actually responded because she had a Polynesian marking. That's on. right. Remember that? Yes, I do remember yeah, that. Yeah, and I was and like, was how white. is she going to disrespect two <laughs> two indigenous people? Like, <laughs> two birds, one stone. Literally. <laughs> yeah, she got both of us. She hit both of us. Like, That's true. You did send it to me. And I was like, I've actually been sent this video before. And it's yeah. a white girl. A yeah. British girl. Yeah, and she blocked me on everything. <laughs> she blocked me too. That's yeah. so funny. Love that for us. <laughs> She had tribal on her face. On we don't her even face right here, and it was Samoan tribal. Yeah, and then and she we had don't do my face. Yeah, yeah, she. I swear to God, I think she took a picture of you and was like, "Give these to me." Yeah. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I forgot about her. Yeah. That's so funny too because this is shows how fucking dumb you are because Samoan people don't get face tattoos like not that's not part <laughs> like I'm sure some Samoan people have tribal on their face but that is not a cultural practice mm -hmm. that's actually Maori people mm -hmm. who are from New Zealand that's yeah. different they're also indigenous mm -hmm. and they do I think they're called mokus if I yeah, remember correctly but yeah, yeah and they do uh, the women do like the mouth uh, and the chin mm -hmm. and men do the whole face mm -hmm. and it's like that's their those are facial markings for their tribe mm -hmm. so like you are picked the wrong one too like you just, you're being racist and you racist to the wrong people what is your problem girl every person you creatively envy is someone that you are meant to collaborate with creatively they are not your nemesis babe they are your expander I would like to praise whoever runs this Twitter account for posting Home Alone 2 Lost in New York star Donald Trump's mugshot has been released. Fantastic actor, sad to see him go down this road. They had to make sure the post is technically discussing a film. I did not get what that was talking about, but this was posted on at discussing film, so they did their job. A lot of people are commenting Home Alone star? Anyways, this other newspaper took a different approach. Um, here is Donald Trump's real mugshot. He looks like shit. The difference in beauty standards for women in a lesbian culture versus what straight men think is attractive is just, it is so different. I've been thinking about this recently because there's been that trend that I've seen a lot on lesbian TikTok of lesbians using that sound from the Barbie movie of like anywhere else I'd be a 10 and then putting the caption of like when you're a six in straight world but you're a 10 in lesbian world and it really made me think how true that actually is. 
especially when you look at the comments from all these lesbians that are like, wait, you're not a 10 it, for, for straight people? You're, that doesn't make sense to me. And I'm there agreeing with the comments like, wow, yeah, that girl is a 10. Like, how could someone not think that she's a 10? And then straight people are like, no, yeah, she'd probably be a six for like a straight man. And that's really sad. I really feel for straight women who are under so much pressure to conform to this very specific beauty standard that men have put out there of like what you're supposed to look like. Whereas I think that in lesbian culture, like just women who are attracted to women, we can find beauty in all sorts of different styles, looks, ways of presenting oneself, like body types. And of course, there are going to be exceptions to that. Like not every lesbian is the exact same. People have different preferences. But in general, from like all the lesbians and like women loving women that I have ever talked to, we all just have this appreciation for different types of beauty and all types of women. Like, yes, I am primarily attracted to more mask presenting women, but I will look at a femme woman and be like, she is gorgeous. Like, I will look at any woman, like, ever, <laughs> and just think that she's beautiful. Like, it, I don't think I, I could give you a woman that I think is ugly because I genuinely think that all women are just so, like, just the women. They're, women are great. Whereas straight men, a lot of the time, are very judgmental of women's looks and are not afraid to say so and it's just really sad like women are so great and yet you're gonna sit there and tear down their looks because they don't look like this very specific type that you've been brought up to think is what is attractive i've said this before and i'll say it again if you ever are insecure about how you look just ask yourself would a lesbian find this attractive the answer is yes they would Christ, I just sinned again, but I'm so thankful that you died and that you rose again. Can we stop this? As someone who grew up in the church, who spent most of my time in church doing youth ministry, and also as someone who studies hip hop, who's a hip hop historian, right? There are a few things that frustrated me more than seeing the appropriation of hip hop music being used by especially white folks or white churches as a sway to young people. This happens all the time, but people are doing it with an ego's music. Hi, I've been saved by grace. I got Jesus on my mind and his blood running through my veins. Chains gone, I've thrown them all away. No, 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 no. Hell no! And now people are doing it with Fiona Boss's music. You love your grace, your mercy, you know it's so evident. Me and the spirit, we in sync just like a pop band, yeah, yeah. Cut the shit the fuck off! Bro, what is it? Bro, what is he doing? I don't know, I really don't know. Like if those opening lines don't reflect the relationship that you might have with Jesus or whatever the case may be, that's perfectly fine. But you took their music and their symbolism as some attack or some critique or some countercultural thing to Christianity. And then you take your Christian identity and ideologies and use that to make a purified version of their song. And you have young people listening to these songs and viewing these people as people who are demonic or people who are trying to attack the Christian faith. When all that is actually happening is that young people are pursuing their passions and having fun with it. Music that people are clearly connecting to. There's no need for you to go out of your way to recreate their music on their beat in order to get views and draw attention to your social media platforms. I think stuff like this is further proof of the colonial roots of white evangelical theology. To think you can just take something and recreate it and then make it more pure and make it better. Those are the traits of white supremacy. Appropriation. Hijacking. Theft. And I'm sick of it. Stop. Cut it out. And another thing, you're tired of the demonic lyrics swirling around in your head? Hi, I'm from outer space. I got Milky Way for blood, evolution in my veins. That's some Afrocentric theology right there. It's talking about being connected to everything, to nature, to the world around you. The idea that we're all connected is an Afrocentric idea. And just because theology isn't your theology doesn't make it demonic. And the fact that you think that it is, is white supremacy. I can follow for more content. Y'all, shit's heating up here in Atlanta. I'm not talking about the 95 plus degree weather that we've been having. I'm talking about the fight against Cop City. I've been in it for like, what, eight months now? More than that, like 10, 11, we're going on a year. I don't know. It was the first time that I had heard about it. Obviously the fight has been going for much longer than I've been involved. It's been going since they announced it back in 2017, after they promised that the forest would actually be given to the black community there, given its terrible history right next door of the prison farm. And if you guys have been following this long enough, then you've seen the murder of Tortuguita, you've seen the arrests of the forest offenders charged with domestic terrorism, you've seen the people getting arrested for putting out flyers and them trying to put them up for 20 years, you've seen them going after the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, like, you've seen it all. You've seen them arresting a 76-year-old woman, like, we've seen it all truly here. 
And yesterday there was the protest for Johnny Holman's family seeking justice after police murdered him last week when he called for help after a minor traffic stop. He was a deacon at his local church and a pillar in his community. And with the war that Andre Dickens, our mayor, has been doing against the Cop City referendum campaign, that's only request is to put Cop City on the ballot after we got over 100,000 signatures to do it. It only took 70,000 to put it on the referendum, but now they're doing everything in their power to stop those signatures from actually counting after Trump did his little pit stop at Fulton County Jail where seven inmates have died this year alone. Seven. All of this is to say that shit is really heating up here in Atlanta and if you want more information from our perspective, from the people that want the Wilani Forest to stay standing tall, which again, it's literally one of the four lungs of Atlanta. Like this is, it's common sense. We need it for our drainage systems. We need it for the well-being of that community. We need it more than we need a city for cops. So yeah, if you want something from our perspective rather than the state propaganda that they're feeding the Atlanta citizens, even though clearly we all don't want this motherfucking cop city to be built considering the 100,000 signatures that we've got which is more than Andre Dickens got in his last campaign. I highly recommend that you go watch Beneath the Concrete the Forest. I, Means TV gave me a heads up that they were releasing it and they obviously were like hey if you want to watch it that'd be sick because I'm already a member and you know it's a worker co-op it's a worker owned streaming service so I'm all for them in general but fuck was I not ready for how good it was. Um, I just please go watch it. It was really fucking good. Um, I tried not to cry given that I knew that I was going to record right after and I'm wearing makeup, but just seeing the members of the community, like beloved commune be there, like fuck y'all, it's so fucking good. Like the Forest Defender said in the video itself, this movement was born from love, not only love for each other, but love for the forest. I have so much love and respect for every single person in this movement. I, I genuinely, I can't express it. So yeah, no cop city here, no cop city anywhere. Being called racist is fine. Being called racist is not the end of the world. I get called a racist constantly, usually from white people. And the thing about it is that it, it, does, it does nothing. It causes no harm. So maybe in instances when you have defended yourself against a black person being mean to you, uh, maybe you were being racist about it. And that's why you were called a racist. Um, but maybe you weren't. And maybe you were called a racist anyway. And that could cause some temporarily hurt feelings. Um, but it doesn't have to impact you in any lasting way because there's no systemic backing behind it. Like there is with racism. Hi, is this where I do registration? Uh, I think he's going into the third grade. Shh, shh, mommy's talking. This is a high school? Oh, that should be fine. I have to go to the elementary school? Hold on. Babe, you sent me to the wrong school. No, you said register him for school. You gotta communicate better. I'm here now. Yeah, I just don't understand why this town has so many schools. I need to register my son. He's going into first grade. What's a nice boy like you doing working at a dump like this? <laughs> what? You're going into seventh grade? Why didn't you say that? Hey, he's going into seventh grade. No, you didn't say that. Well, I can't read, I, I couldn't read your handwriting on the list. feel like white leftists make bad activists because we are unwilling to do emotional labor on the behalf of other marginalized groups. Basically, if a person needs any convincing at all to believe in a cause, they're seen as disposable and then just thrown away. For example, if you are a white person that has family members that are Trump supporters, but you're relatively safe, let's say you're a cis person, a middle class person, or you're straight. Instead of muting your family members' posts where they're talking about Bud Light being the worst thing to ever happen or that they hate Black Lives Matter, you are in a position where you could sit down and have an honest conversation with them. Explain things from your point of view without going into it trying to be the better person or the right person. And no, I don't think you can de-brainwash someone in one session, but I think that a lot of people that are right-wingers are literally just afraid of looking stupid and when they try to ask questions, we just shit all over them. 
but no, that's work. I don't want to talk to someone. I just want to be an activist so I can stroke my ego and say that I'm a better person because I look at Instagram infographics and don't read shit about anti-racism or gender issues. If you're sharing activist works only with people that you agree with, what is the activist work that you're doing? If you're not going across lines to try and convince people to come to our side, what is the activist work that you're doing? And no, I am not talking about trans people that are unsafe, people of color that are unsafe, disabled people, or any other marginalized identity. I'm talking to leftists where the only barrier to you doing this work is that you don't feel like it and you feel like it's too much emotional labor. And to that I would say, is activism supposed to be easy? Is it supposed to be when you feel like it and when it's fun? Or does it require you to educate yourself and have difficult conversations? Because if what you want is a more just world for marginalized people, you will take this work upon yourself. We're all familiar with the concept of zombies, right? You know, those undead, flesh-decaying corpses that terrorize their prey in shows like The Walking Dead or Michael Jackson's Thriller. But did you know that the concept of zombies actually comes from Haiti and is deeply rooted in Haitian voodoo? Let's talk about it. But first, this video is brought to you by The Cornrow, an amazing new online shop that celebrates the Black experience and highlights vibrant cultures pulled from all corners of the African diaspora. Founded by two sisters of African and Caribbean descent, The Cornrow sells all kinds of affordable and stunning goods for everyone to enjoy and thanks to them I get to keep putting out free content that I love. So if you want to support a black owned business or you're just looking for something to zhuzh up your decor, The Cornrow has just what you need. Go to www.thecornrow.com today and explore with the code TENAISA for 10% off your first order. Now back to the video. For the last 20 years or so we've seen a pop culture phenomenon surrounding the zombie myth from Zombieland to Shaun of the Dead and World War Z. But beyond their Hollywood portrayal as mindless monsters, the zombie myth is actually intricately woven into Haitian voodoo and folklore. In fact, the word zombie actually comes from the Haitian Creole word zombie, meaning spirit, which itself is believed to be derived from West African languages, like the Congo word nzambi, meaning spirit of a dead person, or the Mitsoko word nzumbi, meaning corpse. But how did these words from the African continent travel across the Atlantic and mesh together to become a term so embarrassing? embedded in popular culture. I think you may have an idea. The concept of the undead was something that was already present in various spiritual African practices. And when enslaved Africans were forcefully brought to Haiti, then Saint-Domingue, that concept evolved even further. You see, by the late 1780s, more than 90% of Saint-Domingue's island population was enslaved and because they came from very different cultural and spiritual backgrounds, they developed a new religion, now known as Haitian Voodoo, to unite their different beliefs and face the horrors of slavery to Together. And slavery in colonial Haiti was viciously brutal. In fact, they were so brutalized and overworked that the rate of death of enslaved folks in Haitian plantations was higher than anywhere else in the Western Hemisphere. And due to their relentless and horrific subjugation, death came to be seen as the only escape and a way to return to Longuine, or the motherland, in a kind of afterlife where they could be free. The plantation meant a life in servitude, so for some, suicide became the only way for them to take control of their body. However, Suicide meant being barred from returning to Longuine and forced to roam the plantations as an eternal field hand. And so, it's in these conditions that the zombie archetype emerged. Zombies weren't undead corpses, but rather mindless workers, completely absent of will and completely subservient to their masters. The zombie represented the plight of slavery and becoming one was a threat worse than death because it meant becoming a soulless, basically lobotomized husk deprived of freedom, being controlled by another person for all eternity. It was a slave's worst nightmare and plantation owners used their fear of being trapped in their enslaved bodies forever or zombification to keep them in order and discourage suicide. The zombie thus continued as an image of one being imprisoned in their body forever and after the Haitian Revolution in 1804, it was folded into the voodoo religion and became a part of Haiti's folklore. From there, zombies evolved slightly and represented people who were brought back to life without free will and did the bidding of bookers or voodoo sorcerers. And it was this idea of the zombie that was first introduced to the American public, what with William Seabrook's slightly exaggerated travelogue about Haitian voodoo cults introducing the concept of zombies to American audiences in 19. 
1929, and White Zombie, a movie inspired by said book bringing zombies to the silver screen in 1932. Audiences gobbled up this new, undead, terrifying, and white ghoul, and the rest is history. Hollywood mutated the zombie legend into something else entirely and absorbed it as entertainment, wiping away any memory of its origins. Where today zombies make for a good escapist fantasy, they once represented the real life horrors of enslavement. They were a symbol of a time where humans were denied control over their own bodies, and those scars left a deep mark on the subsequent concept of the zombie in Haitian voodoo. Ultimately, the zombie traveled a long way to become what it is today. I mean, from enslaved Africans to its rise in popular culture, the zombie has truly taken a life of its own.